Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Comic Shop Talk on the Late Night Collectors community. I'm your host, Nico, and join with me today, as always, my co-host, Chris. How you doing? Hey, not too bad. How are you? Good. Uh, yeah, not too bad. Ready to talk some comics here today. I've had a really great weekend. Uh, the sun is shining and the snow is mostly <laughs> off the ground. So, <laughs> so yeah. Third winter. yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, yeah, welcome to spring, Chris. <laughs> welcome to the Toronto weather. <laughs> yeah. But uh, make sure to subscribe to the channel, guys, because we talk about all kinds of things here, not just the weather currently on our side of the world. <laughs> so, talk about comics. We talk about the new comics that we're looking forward to, to, to checking out that are going to be coming out. Uh, you know, in June today, we're going to be talking about the new solicitations that drop. So we kind of talk about new upcoming things as well as the current stuff we read week to week. A little bit of comic news sometimes for you guys. And you can also follow us on Instagram at Late Night Collectors Community to kind of check out, you know, the great covers that we pick up week to week. Chris, you had a huge stack this week, actually, which we're going to get to in a moment. Uh, it Just so funny how it differed from the last couple of weeks. It was like double the size this time around. It yeah, like but then looking at it, I don't know. I don't know what, what happened to it. It doesn't seem so big now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, make sure to check that out, guys. If you guys want to a special uh, sneak peek uh, kind of prior to us uh, talking about them on the show of the things that we've picked up every week. You can follow us on Instagram. We post little videos, you know, uh, you know, bust out some comments on those as well sometimes. So those are always worth checking out this week. We're going to be uh, talking about the new comics that came out for the week of March 20th, 2024. And as always spoiler warning guys, if you're afraid about being spoiled about what happens in the books about, you know, uh, looking at the art that we're going to show off here, just you can always read your books and come back and check us out later. We have a whole playlist of 120 and counting of these episodes, guys, here in the Late Night Collectors community. Yeah, make sure to check that out. And uh quick other plug, too. You can check out Chris he, or Chris's finger, I, I should say. <laughs> uh, if you want an explanation of that, you got to go check him out over at our, another video that just dropped. Of cracking packs with the chat. That's one of our other shows that we do here on the late night collectors community. Sometimes we open up cards, sports cards, collectible cards, all kinds of different things. So uh, Chris was recently on an episode and uh, his camera view, it, it uh, left a little bit to be desired. It was really, really the star of the show is the cards that he was cracking and opening up. But Chris made up for it. He kind of had his uh, his little buddy there along for the ride here. <laughs> <laughs> his finger is what I'm talking about. He, had, he, he, he drew a little a happy face on it. It was pretty funny. He kind of put him in the frame. How'd you come up with that idea, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> the spur of the moment. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it was, it was it was really it was a lot of fun. So make sure to go check that out, guys. We're still on the chase for that Bedard, or possibly we pulled it. I don't know. Uh, you got to check out the video, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's always a lot of fun. Make sure to check those videos out too. Cracking packs with the chat, another show we do here on the channel sometimes. So, all right, Chris. That all being said, all right. Well, let's talk comics. Talk some comics. Cheers to the giant Cheers. beer. Look at this. Oh, is that that huge can that you got there? <laughs> yeah. I got some Corona with some lime here today. So, yeah, that's always a treat. So, here we wow. go. Nice. X-Men Forever number one, Chris. One of, I think this is a four-issue miniseries written by Karen Gillan, who previously was writing um, Immortal X-Men. Um, what did you think of this? Well, I, was, I didn't know what to think when it came out. I was, I was thinking of passing the whole thing, but I'm kind of glad I went to pick it up. It, it explains a lot what's going on and kind of puts a lot of the stories together. Because, like, I don't know, I was kind of a bit, I don't want to say confused, but there's a lot of stories going on, you know, with the, what's that, uh, what are they calling it, the, the singularity or, I don't know, where they want, or Dominion, that's it. I thought that story, you know, that story kind of faded to the background, but I guess that story is still in play. And it kind of brings up some of the stuff that's going on there and all the things they're trying to do with the time traveling with Moira, trying to find her up there. You know, it's a bit of a wordy comic. I don't know if it was action packed, but I think it did explain a lot of things. And yeah, this stuff with Mother Righteous, how she's fitting in and kind of exactly how she's been doing things. So, and uh, so I think that uh, really helped tie all, like, you know, if you're reading a lot of this stuff, it helps tie it all together. And I appreciated that reading it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the main reason why I picked this up, and as you mentioned, I wasn't too sure about it either. 
is because Karen Gillan's name was attached to it. So since he did, he did write Immortal. If you guys were following Immortal X Men, if you guys were following the Sins of Sinister type event stuff, which was also written by him, this is basically just a continuation of that storyline and everything that kind of led into this moment with the end of this Krakoa era stuff happening. I actually, I would say that this is more the ending of the current day stuff that Karen Gillan had written in this series more so than the other one that he's doing, because that one's uh, what uh, was it a hundred years in the future or whatever that rise of powers of X yeah. one is, which Karen Gillan's also writing as, as uh, you know, cause Jerry Duggan's doing his own current day kind of wrap up to the Krakoa era stuff. That's all future event stuff that may or may not happen or whatever that's taking place at a future time and place. This is kind of dealing with a lot of the stuff that Gillen was leading up to. And like I said, and I, you know, like you, Chris, like I, I'm not going to sit here and say, I understood a hundred percent everything that's occurred in, in, in this storyline and including what's happened in this issue. Cause there's a lot going on, but I thought it was pretty good and informative and it did kind of, um, it, it, there was a lot of interesting things going on with the whole sinister type stuff. Um, they kind of took out all the sinisters now, it seems like, and, and, uh, and uh, Xavier was able to get rid of whatever sinister bit was left inside of him in this issue. So yeah, this yeah. is important stuff. I think, I think even... here, uh, Professor X did realize that the X-Men or uh, the mutants are still alive. You know, I was, yes. we weren't really sure up until now, whether he knew that or not. And, you know, that was a good reveal there. So, so there are big things going on in here. That's what I mean. I think this is required reading. If you've been reading majority of the Krakoa stuff, this is, or Karen Gillen stuff for that matter, this is, which I, I wish sometimes it would brand these differently because again, unless you kind of seen his name on there, was like, oh, maybe this is a continuation of his story. I don't know if you would necessarily know to pick this up, right? Like, cause, so I'm glad we did. And, uh, and it is, I think, essential to the overall kind of story. So yeah, good stuff. Good art too, actually. Yeah. Art was good. Uh, what'd you give this out of five? Would you say? I give it a three point seven five. Yeah, I think that's that's the right number for this one. Yeah, three point seven five out of five. All right, next up we got Cobra Commander number three, continuing these uh, Energon Universe books here. Got, we got different covers for this one. Yeah. Yeah, you just got the eight cover here. Yeah, I got the. This is another eight. comic I wasn't really thinking about uh, buying. Uh, originally i think they, you know my uh, lcs they kind of just threw it in my butt in my uh, pull list and for i'm glad they did you know this is another good issue you got uh, cobra commander he's a captive of the the dreadnoughts and just the style of the writing it's a very adult story well, i don't want to say adult story but it's definitely not for kids and uh, you know just thinking about that the other day you know with this story now you know if this was back in the day when the gi joe these stories would never be able to come out you know imagine the hasbro or whatever would be saying hey you know we can't have our characters doing this you know they, they were trying to sell kids toys to kids and you know, at least here i think you know it seems like the chains or the shackles have been off for the writing and they're allowed to do sort of almost whatever they want with these characters you know they have whatever uh kind of the cobra commander getting tortured yeah. you know the dreadnoughts in there when uh I guess the leader wants to get their attention. He just shoots one of the guys point blank for no reason. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Then I guess at the end, uh, I don't know who Cobra commander is a uh, buddy with from is a globulus or wherever they come from. He seems to take care of some business there. So, so I don't know it's just, I thought it was a pretty good story. You know, some classic Cobra commander lines. You can see him sort of assorting, asserting some authority. You know, he doesn't buckle under the under the torture either. So it's it's good to see him as a, a stronger character, not you know that the spineless kind of uh Weasley character that he's always made out to be previous to this. Yeah, there's some top notch violence in this, I thought, and like you said, it's kind of like more of a definitely more mature take on uh, on some of the GI Joe stuff for sure, and. You know, we get everything from torture in this issue to, uh, <laughs> you know, um, basically the guys coming at each other with chainsaws and <laughs> dismembering them. And and that whole, like, the Cobra Commander, the whole bit about him getting inside of the Dreadnought's heads, I thought was really fun. Like, kind of getting them to fight each other, essentially just getting in their heads, playing, like, mind games and shit with them while he was being held hostage. 
the whole kind of scene with them drawing the bloody kind of happy face on his helmet. I thought it was really cool. <laughs> And uh, yeah, but he turned into like a big uh, creature there. I guess what what he what he actually is. I guess he shredded off his human disguise or whatever that he yeah. had him wearing. And uh, yeah, I was ready to throw down here at the end. So yeah, it was quite the ending. It looks like he made easy work of the rest of these treadnoughts who were, uh, I guess, had energon in their swamp. So that's the whole reason that Cobra Commander was led here to begin with. And now it looks like he's going to steal that for himself and be on his way right um I, you know I, I do still think this is out of all three um the transformers duke and this is still is my least favorite but that's not to say it hasn't been good as well and that's i think just to show you how good i think the line has been from these initial releases of this energon universe stuff uh, after void rivals right so um yeah it somehow is my third favorite out of all three of those titles um i think duke's just kind of edging it out Transformers has been my favorite, probably because of the art, I guess, and top of everything else. But uh, it, this has been enjoyable. I agree with you, Chris. This has been a good mini series. So I know they also just re recently announced a couple of other ones that are going to come out. Um, yeah, uh, you got Destro and Scarlet. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm I kind of said I'm all in on these. I do kind of want to continue. There's no reason for me not to at this point because I have enjoyed all of these, but it's just like I just I just don't want to get to the point where we do get a week one among amongst all of the, the bunch of these. Like, how many are they going to do before they uh, actually roll out the ongoing kind of G.I. Joe series? Like, yeah. I kind of thought that maybe it was just going to be these two. Then they were going to do the ongoing. Um, you know, I'm in for the next round if that is the plan by the end of it. But I kind of just would rather them just have one G.I. Joe, one Transformer series coming out right now. But uh, we'll see. I, just because uh, these have been good introductory kind of series, though, to these characters. Because, like I said, I'm not very well versed in the G.I. Joe s side of stuff. But I've been enjoying it, so it's been good. What would you give this out of five? I might give this a four, I think. Uh, yeah, I can get there with a four on this one. This is my this is probably my favorite issue of the miniseries so far. So, yeah, yeah I'll give this a four for sure. Yeah. Uh, next up, Wonder Woman number seven this week, Chris. Yep, it's got the A cover there. Not bad. A little brief interlude from the, the Sovereign War. We've got uh, Wonder Woman and Superman getting together to get Batman a present. So, you know, I didn't know what to expect from this one here, but uh, it was a generally entertaining story. You know, I thought the art was great. I guess uh, I don't think it was Daniel, so it's Sampra on, on art here. But whoever came in to fill in, I think they did a great job. <clears throat> you know, even though it's still light on story, they still had some, you know, some beats, I guess, from what's going on. I know I think Superman, you know, tried to broach the subject with her a few times about what's going on with the Amazon war there. And, you know, he's kind of say, hey, you know, you need some help. And she's like, no, no, I got to handle this on my own. And then, you know, they kind of get back into their uh, their business trying to find this present for Batman in some space mall or something. And I did like at the end where, you know, she goes, Oh, I do need help for something. You know, you think she's going to ask him, you know, maybe, you know, maybe she changed your mind and she wants help. You know, this could, could change this, the whole uh, tone of this sovereign war, but it just seems that she lost her parking ticket and, you know, under, under great uh, penalty. If you lose your parking ticket, she might have to That's right. pick things up there somehow, but they, they, generally I thought it was a great story. You know, a nice break from everything, and uh, I thought it was good. Yeah, and there's all these great funny bits in between, like them just having a day in the mall, <laughs> kind of like, you know, catching up and all this because they're friends. And, uh, like, well, there was this, like, this creature here that, like, basically was trying to buy, like, some uh, kryptonite because <laughs> he saw Superman in the mall. And, and, the, and the guy keeps asking me all these questions as he's trying to, like, cash out with it. And he's like, he's like, whatever, whatever. Yeah, just give me whatever. Yeah, yeah, just wrap it up. I just need to take it right now. Like he's, like, he's gonna leave. God damn it! He's like, I'm gonna miss him. Like he's trying to like go fight, you know, uh, uh, Clark there. And it's kind of great because he's just sitting there talking to Diana. And all of a, all of a sudden, because I guess the kryptonite is getting close to him, he starts to grow like weaker. And like Diana, without like skipping a beat, just like jumps in and like kicks the shit out of this uh, fucking like Minotaur dude or whatever the hell he is. And yeah. and then they just kind of continue on their way which I thought was really fun. And 
uh you know just again some of the comments about batman throughout this and yeah just the ideas they come up with you know and uh you know they're back and forth once you know, shoot them down or he's trying to come up with new ideas yeah i mean when i we had uh seen each other the other day and i had talked to, the, to you uh, briefly about this and uh you know i'll stick to what i said it is just it's, this was just a delight like a delightful fucking issue like it just it was it, and, and and honestly it was it was nice to have in between the big serious kind of storyline that we've had like i like when they do these kind of one-off issues where it's like a lot of fun uh bring in a nice guest artist gillian march on this issue did a great job um yeah this was fun the whole mr mixoplick uh movie that he kind of went to to watch uh where they're making fun of him and batman uh yeah it was just some really good stuff good funny bits good art enjoyable one-shot issue they went for a pedicure or a manicure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, by the end of it, their whole thing, uh, their their present to Batman was was uh, was good. I like how they kind of threw in some money on top of it because they mentioned how Bruce is broke now, which is still the stupidest fucking thing ever. I don't understand why they're continuing with that nonsense, but it is co in continuity. So apparently he's still broke or br not super rich anymore, let's say. Yeah. And and uh, so he kind of, he throws in a, he crushed him a diamond. <laughs> I gave him a diamond and which uh, Bruce at the end, I thought that was a nice little bit, left it for a uh, orphanage, essentially like one of his orphanages um, that he funds. And um, instead of taking it for himself, right. Which is also something that they mentioned. They're like, uh, Bruce is not one for charity. And then Superman's like, listen, I'm just going to throw in this diamond just in case he can do whatever he wants. with it." Right? <laughs> uh, yeah. They take the picture booths, the pictures and yeah, fun stuff. I, uh, I really, really, really like this issue. I had a hard, I have a hard time really finding any, any, anything negative to say about this one. Actually. I thought it was really great. What'd you give this out of five? I think it was, sitting on a 4.25 for this because it was one of my favorite comics this week i gotta give it like a 4.5 even verging on 4.75 i'm trying to do better with my just throwing out fives these days because uh you know chris grades at a, a much harder scale so i don't want to just come in guns blazing uh me a year ago with this issue i probably would have given it a straight up five but uh I, you know, it did make me, make me chuckle a couple of times. I did thoroughly enjoy it. So I'll stick at a 4.5 out of 5 this issue this week for sure. Um, I can tell you what would have made this whole issue garbage. If this was done with uh, maybe the same style that uh, Harley Quinn has been going through or. Oh, or yes. Or girls out where they use that kind of uh, whatever. I think I almost call it that Archie type, type of comic. That would have just been, that would have just totally buried this comic. You know, it's still, you know, with a great art style, it kind of still left the. Uh, you know, a decent tone to the comic, you know? Absolutely. Still kind of made it serious, even though it was a, a lighthearted issue. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, good good artist to bring on this issue, honestly. Like, if you're going to give uh, Daniel St. Pierre, like, some time off in between the arc or whatever, and, you know, this is uh this is a welcome uh you know um artist to bring onto the book i thought gillian march i i like gillian march i um i haven't liked everything that this artist has done but i thought that he looked really good here so yeah i was really happy with this uh next up chris the scorch number 27 is it 27 27 or 20 yeah 27 okay uh, sorry, I don't have art for this one, actually. This isn't one I was able to get art for in time, unfortunately. But if you want to show off some of it, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, I think this is with uh, Steven Segovia. You know, he's one of my... I've always enjoyed a lot of the work that he's done, so that's a top-notch artist in there. Yeah. And, you know, this is taking place, I think, six months after the... after the war, or after the war in hell, so all the... all the spawns or the hell spawns, whatever they want to call themselves. They don't have any powers. So they're still somehow attached to their costumes, but they have no powers. But they can take their costumes off and all that. So this one sort of starts out with uh, Jessica Priest. She spawned. You know, she's almost enjoying her time with old powers there. She's with the medieval spawn. And, you know, I think medieval spawn almost had that voice inside of the back of his head that was, or the, the alter ego of medieval spawn. He was... He always had the voice of medieval spawn in his head, so that seems to be gone now. But you know, as these uh spawn or hell spawn people, they do have enemies still. So she gets hit by a sniper right off the bat in this comic, so that sort of sets the tone. And they don't really know who the enemy is here, and that's what most of the comic is about. It's about them trying to figure out who the enemy is, 
you know, there's still some people with powers here. Haunt. Oh yeah. He's still yeah. floating around. You know, I'm not sure of his history, but I don't, I don't think he's an agent of hell or heaven. So he seems to be untouched. And, uh, you know, they're just still running around trying to figure out who it is. It turns out to be the agency. I think it's uh, somebody that she spawn might've worked for that they thought was defunct, but uh, I guess now they're back and uh they're hunting the they're hunting the spawns and i think at the end is it jason win i don't know who he is but uh he seems to be the big bad there i don't know if i can yeah he had it before, him. Had it before. <laughs> i don't know glare there but yeah he seems to be the big bad so i think this sort of reset that they have after that 350 spawn i think it's interesting and it's sort of it allows everybody to kind of get back in and you don't have to worry about who's who and, you know, all these power sets that are coming out. It's, you know, every, everybody's on a level playing field mm -hmm. or mostly. And uh, it's a good, I'm kind of enjoying these spawn comics a lot more than I did before the 350 so far. So I'd so, see how it goes. So it was a welcome change up in the storyline then, it sounds like. Yeah, I reckon yeah, throughout yeah. The, at least throughout the couple titles that I'm reading, because I am only reading Spawn and, and Scorched. Right. But you give, but, it uh, give it a 3.75. 3.75? Okay, nice. Yeah, Segovia is good. I like his stuff. I, I, uh, yeah, because that's who that was who did that, um, that Hellion series, right? Yeah, yeah, good stuff. Yeah, for sure. Uh, all right, next up, we got Spawn 351 there, Chris, which I got a question for you at the end of this. Oh, you're out of there. I did see a page on the uh, on the artwork at the end of this book. Something that we actually were just talking about the other day that kind of piqued my interest a little bit. Yeah, so, I did yeah. check it out too. I think. Yeah, yeah. But go ahead. But yeah, so we have Spawn here, and you know he's in the same story. This is happening, I think, six months after. They have a new artist for this one too. I think was it is it Brent Booth? I think his name is Brett Booth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, not for he's a list and. I guess right off the first page there, they're uh, making sure everybody knows that this is not a comic for children. It's yeah, it's orange. Yeah, what uh, <laughs> is that blood there? A vampire or something? And I guess he's just taking, he's waking up from his slumber there with uh, a bevy of people, not uh, everybody out there that's with them. Yeah, and I guess he's just got the news that those dead zones have sort of expanded, so all the agents of hell are having don't have powers. So he's trying to mobilize his people to kind of seize the advantage. I think he's a vampire or something. So I guess vampires are still in play. And <clears throat> we have Spawn here. I think he he ends up going to some local uh, underworld hangout to try and find out if if you can cure vampirism for whatever reason. I'm not sure why he wants to do that. And, you know, he's kind of talking there. So everybody's almost taking their shots at Spawn now because he has no powers. But, you know, he's still a trained... Uh, sure. I guess he's still a trained badass, so he doesn't take uh, to their threats too kindly. But uh, basically, he's setting up a trap here. He wants to go there to kind of be seen and put the word on the street that he's looking for the vampires. And he ends up taking off to his uh, a little hideout there to try and ambush them. And of course, the vampires take the bait and they show up there. I think three of them are supposed to come by, but these two vampires think, you know, hey, he's got no power. We could just take them on our own. So they try and get in there, and, uh, you know, Spawn kind of takes care of them. And, uh, you know, then a big vampire shows up at the, at the end that he kind of beats up too. But I'm not sure who that person is at the end. I think that's somebody there that's. Uh, who is that? That might be a new character. I think that was a person that came to help Spawn. Okay. So be a new uh, new ally there. Right. But if you see the next page, then we can go into what we we're talking about earlier. Yeah. So I had mentioned to Chris the other day because I know that he had, you know, he had shown off in his video, the preview video this week that he was he had picked up the new Spawn and Scorch and all that, and and I said, uh, you know, since you've been reading Spawn again lately, do you know if the actual like energy counter thing that he, that Spawn the whole concept that Todd McFarlane came up with originally with Spawn is when his counter ran out, uh, he would basically die because he wouldn't have any more of this, uh, this uh, the, the energy, whatever that, like, I guess, fuels him or whatever. So then I, when I was putting the art together, I saw this page at the end of the issue, and I was like, is that the counter? Does that mean he's 
slowly getting power back or like what's like because like technically without his power he's supposed to be dead but you're telling me right now they're powerless so man is that what's going on or what's the deal here do you know anything about this or well i guess they're still attached to their suits they just have no power so okay. he could be powerless but he's still you know empowered i guess by the by the hell spawn so maybe that's what the why that's at zero 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 one it's okay. basically the lowest power he could have Right, I'd imagine like having Sandra having not uh, had a great shoot to sort of bounce that uh, number off of, you know. Right. So, so it was there, but they never really touched on it. You feel like in this issue, I wonder if that's still a thing. Look, I got if I look through my back issues, I remember seeing those numbers out there all the time. Right. But I had no idea what they were. I was like, you know, I never really looked at the number i thought it was just the date that the next comic was coming out or something yeah and when we but, looked uh, it up when we looked it up when i because i was curious about it when we googled it what we came across was like two or three years ago they said that he was bringing that concept back into play so maybe that's what's happening here right i always thought that was an interesting kind of idea but also there's the fact that like he would actually have to stick to like, like you know, the, the, you would have to kill Spawn like forever, essentially, if that happened, which yeah. is not going to happen. This is a fucking cash cow still for him. He's putting out like ten new titles this year or whatever. But like, I know it has its specific audience. It's not like it's the hottest book on the stands, but you know, it still sells whatever, and uh, and it's still you know it's still it's still going right. Three hundred fifty issues later, so you, there's not much you know. You can, you can say what you want, but that's still a big achievement these days to kind of keep this comic going, right? So yeah, what'd you give this? Uh, I give it a three point seven five. Good stuff. Okay, cool. Uh, Catwoman sixty three, Chris. Let's see, I got Catwoman sixty three. This is still following this uh, this nine lives story where she's trying to kind of take on these crazy jobs here that she thought uh, she wouldn't do just because they're too dangerous. And I guess ever since that. Uh, that Vandal Savage meteor hitter. She's been sort of blessed with these nine lives. Hey, you know, hey, Catwoman underwater. I don't know why she has to go to this. Oh, she's going to Atlantis or an Atlantean output base to try and stuff. I forget what she's trying to steal here, but she's out there after something. And I think she gets it. She ends up losing one life. And somehow this this cat world comes back to her, you know, looking through it. It's got a lot of action. The art is great, but this, this whole storyline with this kind of cat goddess that's been following her, that's a bit odd. You know, if they can kind of tone that down or if that wasn't part of this story, you know, if there's just kind of magically had nine lives somehow that would kind of simplify the story a little bit, you know, unless it all comes to play in the end, but outside of that, you know, it's a good looking comic, uh, you know, it's a decently engaging story. And you know, I, I'm I'm not I'm not uh, disappointed that I'm picking this up still. You know, I might just try and finish off this nine live story. I'll see what the next arc holds, but uh, it might be done after that. I yeah, I give this maybe a three point seven five two. You know, it's better than good, or better than average. Right. Okay. Uh, next up, we got beneath the trees where nobody sees. Number four. I've been enjoying this series. I actually don't know how long this series is supposed to be. Cause I kind of heard about it through word of mouth after the first issue dropped. And I don't know if it's like, it does seem like it could be potentially be coming to a close in five, six issues. So this might just be a mini series. And again, this is like basically Dexter with animals, essentially, essentially anthropomorphic animals and in a town, like a Richard scary type town. And, um, because like, you know, there's the character that, that we follow in this book that is basically the Dexter, like he kind of like, um, she kind of like, um, is killing people in the town and unknowingly, and she, they, they comes across that there's another person that's now killing per the people in the town and the bear catches, um, them basically confronts them, figures out who it is and confronts them in this issue. And it's like this mouse character. And then the mouse is kind of like, Hey, you know, like I, 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 I was new to this town. And then I, I came across, like, I, 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 I oversaw you doing something suspicious and I fi I figured I'd follow you. So I started like basically stalking you and following your movements. And I guess like he saw, saw the bear, like uh, commit a couple of these murders or disposing of the bodies and unknowingly to the bear, like he, he was following her 
this whole time. And like he and and he's like, hey, you know, we can kind of, you know, I kind of did all this just basically to get your attention and like let you let you know that I'm into killing people too. And it, it, there was basically a whole story arc season of Dexter that was very similar to what this story is in this comic, though, is what I I, I remembered from what I recall. And and he the, the bear just shut it down. It was just like, nah, we're not doing that. You know, I'm not, uh, we're not, I'm not playing this game with you. you. You do whatever the hell you want, but I'm not, you're, you're bringing attention to stuff like the way you're, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're doing these murders and, and it's, it's bad for me. So cut it out. And we're, you know, I, I can't believe you, you fucking followed me and all this shit. So then she goes on her way to think that nothing's going to be like, I don't know, almost like that's going to be the end of it. It seemed like I, I, which I thought was stupid. And, and then at the hardware store where the bear works, like this guy basically set this thing up where he cut up like some body parts and, and put them in the paint cans. So like this gets revealed like a day or so after they have, she has this confrontation with them. And then it turns out the person that he killed was her coworker at the hardware shop. So now by the end of this issue, the cops are, are after the bear. The bear basically has to like leave the town because they think that she's been the one who's been a murderer this whole time, which she has been, but not for the murders that keep popping up over this, this series so far, which has all been the mouse. So the mouse is just like, yeah, I didn't like the way you talked to me. And if we're not, you know, we're not going to be friends then I don't need you. So I, I'm basically just screwing you over. So that's why I thought it was really stupid of her just to kind of leave, let him like, you know, knowing everything this character knew, like just leaving him in the wind like she kind of did after their disagreement I thought was kind of stupid but now she they found like a bunch of murdered people like they found her co-worker's head on a bandsaw in the hardware shop where she works so she basically just fled uh, you know flew the coop here at the end of this issue it looks like she's in like hot pursuit by the cops and it's said to be continued but I I think this maybe it, it looks like it could come to possibly a conclusion I don't know how long this can go on but it's been pretty good series, though. All that being said, I, I give it a four out of five. Vengeance of the Moon Knight, number three. Yeah, this has been pretty good, too. I've read all of Jed McKay's uh, ongoing Moon Knight series in trade. And then when this mini series or, I guess, relaunch of the series was announced, I've been reading it digitally and talking about it here on the show. And I basically just need to know who this new Moon Knight is. And they've really been drawing out the, the uh, reveal of this so far. Like, um, we're three issues in to this. I guess I'm hoping by the end of this first arc, they'll reveal who it is. But Moon Knight supposedly died at the end of the last series. Spoilers. But now there's a new Moon Knight in town who's not friends with all of his friends in this Midnight Society or whatever that he stuck, that he basically set up. And, and, uh, and this, in each issue, there's been like one of these people that works, that worked for Moon Knight in this, in the, in there, in that whole, that whole house type thing he had set up, uh, talking to like this psychiatrist character that they're all friends with. And this guy's name is soldier. He's a vampire that worked for him. So he's sitting there and talking to her about how he's like, yeah, you know, I realize what Moon Knight made us. We're basically just a gang. And, uh, you know, but we do right by, you know, the people that live in the neighborhood and try to, you know, stomp out evil and all this type of shit. And, and, um, this guy is just doing things wrong, whoever this Moon Knight is. And like, he, you know, he's coming across people that Moon Knight carved, like this new Moon Knight carved a fucking moon into the head of like some vampire guy. So he basically just doesn't give a shit about the people that are just like these monsters or like weird people that live in the neighborhood, even though they may not be trying to do anything bad. He's just, you know, hence the vengeance of the new Moon Knight. He's just running around and beating the shit out of people. <laughs> so basically, this guy's like, this needs to stop. We need to figure out who this guy is. We need to find him. So by the end of this issue, after beating up some bad guys that try to, like, infiltrate their little setup there in that house, he he goes to these uh, vampires in Chinatown who are like a Chinatown gang. And they basically, they're like, we need to know where this guy sleeps at night. And you guys have the best eyes on the city essentially uh every night so you could tell us where he is we need to put a stop to this and so it looks like it, they're gonna get to him possibly or him tigra and the other moon knight the other because there's a right and left fist of conchu basically the other priest moon knight that's uh character in the new dr strange arc right now is also trying to track him down with the rest of them so 
it's been pretty good. The art's really good, very stylistic. I actually gave this a four out of five. I just wish that, I, I mean, it's been a good story, so it's kind of kept me going, but I also do really want to know who this guy is already. I hope they don't draw it out for like, I hope this isn't like a 12 issue story where they're like, oh yeah, this is who this guy is. Like when no one gives a fuck anymore. Right. So I, I, I need them to get to that uh, soon. Uh, Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver number two. I talked about the first issue on this show. I quite liked it. I also read the main ongoing series and trade of this and then jumped on for this mini series, which is kind of like a relaunch with the same creative team, at least the same writer, Steve Orlando. And uh, this is basically um, Magneto. Sorry, Magneto died. They talked about it. Obviously, he's being resurrected currently in the Krakoa stuff, but he had died. And then Quicksilver and Wanda were given notice of that this had happened through a letter. And then they kind of had a falling out with one another, a disagreement as brother and sister. And now that it's kind of them dealing with um, the wizard who's kind of popped up out of nowhere, who's, you know, you know, a famous Fantastic Four villain, too, from what I recall. And and uh, he's basically just, uh, you know, meddling in their lives right now. And and even though they're separated, this is basically continuing the story of Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch kind of trying to figure out who's doing this to them. Scarlet Witch just found out it's the wizard, but Quicksilver's still trying to get down to the get get down to uh the realization that this is uh basically him who's messing with them and they're both just basically trying to deal with him and his little like he has like a group of 100 like wizards like basically like a SWAT team of other people that have like these suits and are using magical and uh you know army tactics it seems like on on these guys so he's got like a little team of of uh, people that are also messing with Quicksilver and then by the end of this issue i think it's like Quicksilver's son I'm not really familiar with him and I didn't realize he had a son or I had just forgotten, but I think he shows up at the end of this and he show uh, it's like a mini Quicksilver. Oh, and Scarlet and Wanda goes back to the vision and the vision is still like in his little vision house, like in the Tom King vision series, which I thought was really cool. So he's kind of still like playing in his like made up life or whatever the hell that he's got going for himself here. So that was kind of neat to see him, her and Vision back together because it's been a while. I feel like we've seen them together. So that was fun. Um, and the art was good. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess this is his son here that shows up at the end, I'm guessing. Or, oh, wait, or is that Wanda's one of her kids? I can't recall. That might be one of her kids. I think she has the two kids, possibly. Maybe that's what it is. Anyways. I give this a 3.5 out of 5. It was good, but not as good as the first issue, but I'll probably still read the rest of it. It's only a four-issue series. All right, Chris. Batman Superman World's Finest number 25, this oversized 25th issue. Yeah, was this uh, Lex Luger or Lex Luger? Lex <laughs> Luger? Lex Luger and the Joker kind of meeting the first time or something? One of the stories was, yes, and then the second story was just like a – like a Batman, a classic Batman, Superman kind of like uh, Mr. Mixoplick kind of story yeah. where he's messing with them at, by the end of it, you find out um, in the Batcave and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess uh, I think Lex Luthor needs uh, the Joker to help him read some sort of some hieroglyph or something that everybody that had read it before went insane. So I guess he imagines Joker's already insane. So he'd be able to read it. And, uh, I thought it was pretty good, you know. That's I don't know if this was supposed to be billed as the the first time the Joker and uh, Lex Luthor were meeting. Either if it was or it wasn't, you know. I think the back and forth between Luthor and uh, the Joker was entertaining, and you know there was a bit of a twist at the end of the story. You know, I think uh, where he goes, he at one point he the uh, what's his name uh, the Joker goes into the washroom and just rips out all his hair. Yeah. And then, you know, kind of a throwaway line there, you know, like someone says, ah, get him a toupee and meet me outside or something. And then at the end of the story, you find out the Joker freaking end up killing all his men in there and was able to, I don't know, take some bomb out of his head or something, or I don't know what it was. But, uh, but it was pretty good. And, you know, for whatever the, the storyline itself that uh, put it together, you know, I'm not sure what they were looking for, if they got it. I don't think it leads to anything anyways, but, uh, but yeah, and I I enjoyed the story, and for the as as for the second story, I don't know what the heck that was about. The... Oh no, no, I was. Uh, which one's this? I thought the second story was those stupid imps again, but 
No, not really. No, no, this is just uh, no, it was good. I wasn't the full story. It's yeah, this is Dan yeah. Mora back on the book with uh, Mark Wade, and this is the one where yeah, it is an amp. It is Mr. oh yeah, the coming at the end, but there yeah, yeah they're, before they do show up, they kind of mess things around in there. You have the dinosaur fighting, and there's some Abe Lincoln statue comes to life. So that was all. That was good stuff. I. You know, I think I'm out of this uh, world's finest after this story, after this issue here, but it's a good issue to leave on. I'll say that much. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I'm sticking with it, but I'm not very much looking forward to this new arc. I'll say that much. So I did quite like this. I thought this was fun. And actually for a 25th issue, I think it was a, a success. Like these oversized issues or these kind of issues where they try to tell a couple of stories like annuals and stuff like that. They're not always successful in that in that sense. Um, I thought this was actually a good mix of two pretty fun stories with good artwork, honestly. So I, I think it was, it was, it, it was a good um, representation of what the Batman World's fine, Batman Superman World's finest series has been. I think uh, the funness of this series, yeah. the kind of the throwbackness of the classic kind of team up stories that they've at, at at this book's best. This is kind of like a good representation. I feel like of the, in this issue. So it's a good, and you can really just pick this issue up and read this. You don't have to have read anything before it, which I thought was good too. It's a good, nice one and done two stories in it. So uh, what'd you give this? I would give this a four. I did really like that stuff with the Joker and Luther. Same. Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, let's see what's next here. Uh, Superman number 12, Chris. Yeah, I just read this one online. I think this is the end of the arc with uh, with with the Croft and farm and all that. You haven't been a big fan of this arc here, I Lex or Lex Luthor's mother or something. Yeah, so I think in this one, they have, they have a kryptonite gas that's you know engulfed or engulfed Metropolis. And I don't know if people are dying with this gas or not, but you know, Superman can't go out there and. And I think uh, Lex Luthor, he goes out in a Superman suit, but if something leaks, he's going to die. You know, I don't really recall how they end up beating everybody at the end, but uh, I think they reversed engineered the the gas or the kryptonite gas or something, you know, so Superman sort of had to use the smarts. And I think, uh, well, I guess the big takeaway from this one might be that uh, Superman was sort of almost acting as a CEO or as a, as more of a general where he's just had to stay in the building to kind of lead the troops. You know, he has some in, inspirational speech there that fired up all the, all the people of uh, Lex Corps or Super Corps, what they, whatever they want to call it. Yeah. One of the things I did like uh, is that those people that work at Lex Corps, they're not evil people. Like, you know, I don't know how the story is going to pan out, but you know, it's not like you can just go to the Lex Corps and you know, take it apart. And yeah, I guess you can see some of the pages they're teasing a bit of the House of Brainiac. I don't know if they really needed to do that in this issue, but uh, we'll see. You know, I wish it wasn't in there because that's the only reason I'd want to have this issue is just because Lobo shows up at the end. But I imagine I'll get enough of that in the in the Brainiac stuff. I I didn't love this. I thought it was um, the arc got weaker as it went on. I thought this was kind of a weak ending. And like you said, I think the only interesting thing about it is possibly the setup of the next arc, which really wasn't even necessary at the end of this issue. Yeah. <laughs> like they could have just left it as is. Um, you know, there was like you said, I I did I do like what you said about the him the actually believing in Lex Corps now, but not so much on uh Lex. It's the people that work for him that are trying to do right by him and this and uh and yeah, whatever this change of heart current change of heart that's going to go back to normal that uh lex is having now like uh you know like a like a, someone else in comics so basically the norman osborne situation as i like to call yeah. it now <laughs> which was really interesting at its peak but it's one of those things where you just know it's going to go back they're going to dial it back eventually he's going to become the green goblin at some point again so well we can talk about that in web of spider-man but there i've read there may be some mystery it might not be a given we'll see We'll see. But what'd you give this? And I gave it 3.25 out of five, I think. Oh, I can't I give this. I I'd uh oh no, this I'm sorry, I looked at world finest. Like, what are you talking? 3.25 for world Superman. yeah, for Superman 3.5. Okay. Next up, Nightwing 112. Nightwing 112. What'd you think? Well, it's more of a back to the Tom Taylor type of uh, stories that I've been used to. You know, it's a it's a good story. You know, you got the the kid that's been kidnapped and 
you know, you got Bruce and Dick working together. So all the beats, they're there. But uh, it still wasn't my favorite. Dokey for me. I don't like this. I hate Nightwing. This is fantastic. I knew you were gonna fucking shit on this book once again. This was this was a fantastic two parter. The last issue and this one, which Chris didn't love either. The last one. <laughs> I'm sorry. I gotta say it. I think this is just great. This is a great fucking two parter story between the relationship between Dick Grayson and Bruce. Uh, and and yeah, he helped out a kid in need, and it really kind of had some great flashback moments. It had some great actual Bruce being a human being for once for moments. He, he even had a fucking great inspirational speech that he gave Gar because he's having to deal with everyone fucking hating him since the fallout of of uh, the Beast Planet shit. And, and the worst part about that is why are the Titans moments the best ones in this fucking title always and not in the Titans book? I don't <laughs> understand why that is. I really liked... I mean, we talked about it. I thought the Beast World's arc was actually... Uh, the 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 um the event wasn't yeah. that, wasn't that bad, and I get the fallout that like, why people don't like the Titans and why they don't like him. They're scared of him. Like, like it makes sense, and I thought that was a really good piece of advice Batman gave to him. He's like, "What does it matter? You know why you're doing it for? You're helping people." He's like, "Fuck everybody else, right?" Like I I kind of liked that. I was just like, again, like I I think it's interesting. I know Taylor's writing both books, but. Why isn't he be putting some of these great moments with the Titans? Because I think the best things for the Titans that got me excited for that series in the first place that Taylor was doing it have been in the pages of Nightwing whenever they show up. So I, I, I just don't understand why he's, it's just like, I get it. This is the stronger title. And maybe that's why he's putting it all his eggs in one basket over here. But it's just like, you know, and Titans hasn't been bad, but like, it's not, I, that moment should have been in Titans. I don't understand why it was in this book, but I get it. Batman was in this story, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, I liked how he beat the shit out of this fucking guy at the end, too. He deserved it, this fucking creep. This guy he just went there and, like, whooped his ass. <laughs> and then, you know, he's, you know, it saved the kid. I loved it. It was, it was a great issue, man. I, I, you know, don't listen to Chris. <laughs> yeah, well, this kid could be the new Robin. This could be Nightwing's Robin or something. Come on. <laughs> I just always love you. Like, yeah, you know, this was decent, but yeah, whatever. It's not going to do it for me. <laughs> <laughs> Chris doesn't like hokiness. He's just like, yeah, what is this? I'm like, in, uh, <laughs> what, like one of those uh, those uh, movies of the week. What is this shit? <laughs> yeah, I'm like a Hallmark card here. You have no heart, man. You're like this character in Nightwing, Heartless. <laughs> this backup, uh, the backup story wasn't too bad, though. Yeah, it's. It, I don't know why they did this backup story, but I. I, I either, but but it was fun, and I actually think that Francesco. It's like a medieval times, like, yeah. Like Joker's like an evil Merlin. I don't know what the fuck's going on. Yeah, it's like it's not like a medieval Joker or something that's with yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He stabs him in this. Uh, but I and I love Francesco Francavilla, the artist. Uh, so I'm I'm kind of glad, but I don't know why. Like they would have got him to do this random fucking backup story. Yeah. But, I, again, with backup stories, I don't know what they think of when they do the these things. Yeah, I okay. like, don't know if they just have that one sitting in the can and go, okay, let's throw it in. Could be it. But it's just not a bad story. I, it almost felt of, like... The only thing I don't like is, oh, they call him Son of Grey. Oh, wonder who that is. Son of Grey. Oh, Grayson. Wow. What a... Right, right. You know what, Chris? Actually, you know what I was thinking? Maybe that was a leftover. Actually, it's funny you say that. Taylor wrote Dark Knights of Steel. That kind of felt like a Dark Knights of Steel type of story, almost like that backup. It's like in terms of like the the time period, right? Like sort of like it, it feels. If you threw that Dark Knights of Steel, you know, a little uh, Grayson story, but then it wouldn't be. Well, maybe it makes the story a lot better. Yeah. So what'd you give this? Get a three point seven five. Four point five. It was a great issue. Great two parter. Great stuff. Titans number nine. Speaking of Titans, <laughs> you read this? Yeah, I did read this because I, you know, I, I kind of saw some panels there, some big things going on here, and uh, you know, I guess. Yeah. I don't know this. This first, this quintessence or whatever. What a sad sock a group of. What do you need? Phantom Strangers in there. Hey, watch it. <laughs> Hi, father. But the only good guy is uh, is the Spectre, and he's just the Herald. You don't like the Phantom Stranger? I don't know. I don't know much of the Phantom Stranger. Uh, I love the Phantom it was Stranger. Era, wizard. Like, frick, come on. At least freaking Marvel has, like, the Watcher. It's just one uh, one being. Not these freaking little panel or council of dummies. <laughs> on the watch. But other than that, we can go on to the story here. 
Well, we got the Titans in Key West. I guess uh, helping out after a storm. I guess that's a great, uh, great job for the Titans there. You know, it's all feel good moments there. They're trying to build back the trust of the the people. And uh, I guess the second part of this story is Trigon is trying to, I guess, make sure Raven follows the path. I do like the scenes there with, uh, with what's his name? Peacemaker. Like this is the, the best, well, not the best version, but the version of Peacemaker I like where, you know, he's just all in where he thinks he's doing right. You know, he's trying to con uh, or not con, but he, he's just telling the newbie there about, oh yeah, we're fighting for the good side and everything. You know, he opens up the door. Try and on there. There. <laughs> you know, Waller's making a deal with the devil, literally. <laughs> And he's like, oops, sorry. <laughs> but like, yeah, like, even how they have to, you know, how Wally even, like, addresses you. Well, I'm going to have to mind wipe somebody there and explain something to somebody. <laughs> that was a good scene. That was a good scene, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the stuff between Waller and Trigon, you know, I think, I think it plays out rather well. You know, it didn't seem to be crazy or uneventful or, like, unreasonable, let's say. And I guess we see, you know, sort of what's going on with, Raven there, you know, she seemed to be acting normal, so I thought maybe something, you know, I missed something, but uh, I guess uh, she's still under the influence, and the, the true Raven is is trapped inside the crystal, and she looks going to be exerting some power here at the end. There, there actually there actually was a couple of funny lines in this issue that you reminded me of that. There's a whole scene where, like, Hera comes, and, and then she's, like, uh, she's speaking to... Um, What's her oh, name? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm moving so fast that only you can see me. Yeah, that flash is like, like, hey, who's that? He's like, hey, Hera, or something like that. <laughs> that was funny, man. I liked that scene. Yeah. yeah. There was a few funny lines in this one, for sure. Like, uh, I thought Taylor did a good job of that. But yeah, that, that Trigon scene with uh, him walking into the room while he, <laughs> Mayor Waller, him were chatting <laughs> was quite good, for sure. Yeah, I, I do like the fallout of that event, like the whole Amanda Waller, like taking over the yeah. justice league thing like that. That's good stuff. I do like that. Like, I, I kind of like that more so than, than seeing the Titans just going and helping people in this book. Well, quite frankly, I, I think they should focus mostly on that. Oh, that was my favorite part. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah so what, what kind of animal are you? You don't want to see the Titans help people. I'm like you. I'm learning from the best here. <laughs> <laughs> that shit was so hokey. <laughs> All right, what what what'd you give this? I'll give it a three point seven five, maybe yeah. a four, but I'll stay at three point seven. Yeah, I agree on that three point seven five. But for that Tricon part, I almost want to give it a four out of five this week. That was fun. Yeah, uh, Pete Baker steals that comic. <laughs> All right, so next up we got Justice uh, Society of America nine. I, I don't got much to say about this, so I'll just make it quick. Uh, I, I don't know, <laughs> Jeff Johns, man. Like, uh, I, 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 I love you. I love your stuff, but uh, <laughs> uh, this is like, I don't know. This is pretty. This keeps getting weaker, and you keep fucking putting like deeper and deeper cut fucking characters in here. Where I'm just like, where are you drumming these people up? I don't know who this book. This book is for somebody who's been a fan of DC Comics and has been alive since the 1960s. Because there's there's some characters in here. Where like I, I feel like I know a good amount of fucking characters, maybe more so on the Marvel side than the DC. But he's playing, he, he's bringing some fucking people, he's unearthing some characters out of like that are coming out of the woodworks. I literally don't think I've been in a comic in fifty years. Like there is some fucking deep cut fucking characters in this book, and I, I look some of them up, and they're all fucking characters, and half of them I've never heard of that he's busting out here. So, uh, I mean, there must be someone who's like loving this out there. Uh, but I, you know, it's just not making the impact on me in that sense. It's because there's, th these are such like golden age fucking characters that he's playing with in this book that I have no reverence for them. I don't know who they are and I have a hard time getting excited for the, some of these people when they show up. Uh, the art's been good. The, the issues seem to be very fucking late all the time. Like this book's been coming out. It's not even on a monthly schedule. I think it comes out like every six, eight weeks at this point. So I, I might just jump ship ship completely. There's only 12 issues, I think. This is the ninth one. I might just wait for the collection to come out and maybe check it out that way. Because I, I do like Jeff John's stuff. I do like Jeff John's GSA run that he did back in the 2000s. I have all the big hardcovers of it. I think there's some really great stuff in that. But this is maybe a case of maybe you can't come home again. I, I just, 
there's just some stuff that isn't hitting with me in this one. And I thought I knew the JSA, at least the core kind of team, but he's playing with like some whole other aspect of characters in this that uh, I think are long forgotten of. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I can appreciate what he's trying to do. I'll say that much, but like for me as a cohesive story, it's just not, uh, it's not, uh, it's not hitting for me. So I got to give this, I got to give it a three, three out of five for my personal enjoyment. I can recognize it's not terrible, but I just, for my personal enjoyment, I got to give it that. So, um, fantastic four, number 18. Um, Again, not much more to add on this. This book's still really good. Another great one and done story. This kind of starts off with them talking about Franklin and how he, you know, his power set is basically like, you know, he can, he, you know, he can basically create anything like <laughs> into existence, essentially. Like he is an Omega. He was, he kind of gives you a good rundown of the character. And I guess a story, uh, something that happened with his character, which I must have forgotten about at some point. He can only tap into his power once a year now, apparently. Like he has it. They did I something. Guess they power him somehow. He was like a freaking, he was too powerful. I can't remember if that's a result of the of the X-Men stuff because there was that whole mini series that Zdarsky did where he tried, they tried to take him and bring him over to Krakoa. So maybe that happened in one of the X-Men books because he talks about that. As as he says, yeah, I was an Omega level mutant at one point and I was this and I was that. He's like, and now I can only tap into my power once a year. And he kind of references the fact that the earth is going to get hit by some asteroids in this that are unavoidable and they're all going to die. And then he uses his powers to basically try to stop that in this, in this issue. But then well, all he does is basically almost like continue to give them chances to solve the problem on their own. So by the end of the issue, it, what happens is uh, the actual fantastic four, his father and everybody, they they're able to, figure out a way to stop the meteors but there's a couple of instances throughout the issue where their previous attempts would have failed and like you see that the earth's going to get destroyed so he kind of he kind of helps them unbeknownst to them in a way during this issue and then they finally get it right by the end and, and uh yeah just again another good one and done issue which um has some really high concept science kind of stuff going on and the more this books come out, the more I kind of don't, I do regret jumping ship and not continuing with it because uh, it is, it has grown on me. And I think this is a really good representation of what the fantastic four can be. Like he is really driving home the idea of these one and done kind of science, like epic type stories. And like they, they're what they're, they actually have reasonings behind why, you know, <laughs> why they're solving these issues all the time. Right. That actually makes sense. Like the guy, the writer actually seems like he knows what he's talking about, that he's smart and some of the high concept stuff I may not get, but like even all the time travel stuff he's touched on, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's kind of really cool. Some of the things that they do in this book. So I think, I think he's got it. He gets it right. So hopefully there's some hope for that movie that comes out whenever that comes out. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Right. So I gave this a 3.75 out of five. Nice. All right, Chris. Uh, Iron Man number sixteen. Iron Man number sixteen. I guess we get to see the Sentinel Sentinel Buster in action. Yeah. And hey, can't complain about that. This is a, the the giant robot there just busting all the Sentinels. You know, I kind of like that they they didn't make it an all. Well, I guess it's an all powerful suit, but once again, it's a limited power. You know, this uh, this suit's giant. It takes a lot of energy. So he only had a limited time to use this. And, uh, you know, even I think at one point there, he realizes that he's almost, he was maybe to take out only half of the, of the, yeah, the, the Sentinels with that, you know, so he thinks he's losing. And uh, I guess Fei Long is in there and he's in a, oh, what's that? A, not a Hulkbuster, an Iron Patriot suit or something. And it looks like they're going to throw down at, at the end of the issue. That's basically just a lot of action. You know, it's almost a bit of the, like the mech sort of action. You know, I got those missiles just shooting out everywhere. You know, and that's, I'm a big fan of all that sort of stuff. And yeah, we'll see where it goes. You know, I, I did like this issue. You know, it's not big on, not, not much, <clears throat> doesn't really move the story forward, but uh, it's, you're a big fan of Dragon Ball Z or something, you know, kind of reminded me of something like that. Where it's just, you know, just all fighting, fighting, fighting. 
and you know he kind of just moved one step forward in the story yeah i this is uh i have no problem with this i mean like obviously i love some uh some more you know character moments and development of the story but it's all been leading up to this big epic battle. So you had to give us one, at least one issue of a big epic, epic battle in his suit. So like, I'm kind of glad that they decided to do that here because yeah, this, this, this was a really fun issue just to see everything kind of go down and him basically fight to the point of exhaustion and deep power, uh, no power and just collapse in the dirt there at the end where he's just like, I, I fucking, I gave it my all. Like, I don't know what the fuck's going to happen now. Right. Mm -hmm. Like uh, that was pretty, that was pretty crazy. And like, uh, obviously we know other things that are happening in the storyline. Um, but this is a very important and integral part to everything. I think going on in this fight against, uh, against the Orcus in the, in the, in the series. So it's, it's been, it's been really, it's been really great. Honestly, it's, uh, I hope he continues and is able to do something uh, after the Krakoa stuff with this Iron Man series. And I hope this just, w but if he doesn't, uh, I'm okay with it. I think it was a great companion piece to that, to the X-Men. Yeah. But I hope the Iron Man series continues on and like, you know, yeah. at least the numbering, it doesn't just drop off and then, you know, we're going to reboot the story again from, yeah. from nothing. Yeah. What'd you give this? I give this a four. It was a good. Same. One. I liked it. Same. Yeah. All right. Next up web of spider. Oh, I guess the last book of the week here, web of Spider-Man number one. Got the Ooh. Greg Capullo covers in tow here. There we go. Great cover, that's for sure. Great cover, yeah. And uh, yeah, this is exactly what we had predicted, Chris. This is a, a preview issue of sorts for all the Spider-Man titles, I guess, moving forward for the year. What would you think? Yeah, I'm not really looking forward to much of the Spider-Man titles. That's what I can say. This didn't get me excited about anything. I think they got to what, Madam Web there. Maybe they thought that Madam Web movie was going to be a blockbuster and so you would add to some of the draw of this uh, comic. Which... I thought the same thing. When I opened up the comic, I'm like, ooh, this is a bad first page to put it here. <laughs> Thank you. I'm like, no one wants to see her in any comic right now, Madam Web. Exactly, yeah. Like, you know, I guess the, the planning before that, oh, Madam Web should be a blockbuster by now, and we'll sell yeah. more comics with Madam Web there. Yeah. I think the art in the, the story was good. But as for any of the, the teases of the storylines, you know, nothing... Nothing really grabbed me. I'm happy that Chasm is free. They could have yeah. maybe, you know, expanded on that story a bit. Basically, he goes, oh, I, I figured out how to use my powers, and I escaped, and the Madeline Pride's like, ah, I didn't really want to keep him anyway, and that's what that's what it was. You know, they, I thought they, they probably could have done a lot more with that story about how Chasm gets out of purgatory. You know, they could have had something with, you know, that's at least a good a good issue you know, they could have blown out of uh, Amazing Spider-Man or something, you know, to to see how he gets free. I'm happy that he's back. And this Goblin thing, that original Goblin or whatever it was, I thought he was pretty cool, but it uh, looks like he's getting sent back to Limbo too. So maybe if you see more of him, we'll find that. As Gwen stuff looked good, but once again, I don't know. Yeah, I thought some of the, I think, like you said, the most interesting thing, I think, was the chasm stuff. Like, some of the things that we're not really dealing with currently in the Amazing Spider-Man series that they previewed in this, which I guess are, like, things to come uh, down the road somewhere. And, and, and really just kind of following up on stuff that's already happened previous to... To, the, to to this current gang war series like you know with the whole chasm stuff popping yeah. back up again and and uh also the talk about like the norman osborne stuff like there's some things that could turn into some interesting stuff somewhere down the road but again this it, the previews in this are, are so short that you can't really get much satisfaction out of any of these things so it's just like you know and, and there's so many spider-man titles and so many i don't care about that yeah. overall this series kind of came and went uh, this, right. This issue. I'm just like, yeah, whatever about any of this stuff, but you know, it, it wasn't the worst, I think, um, of example of these type of issues that we've had even in more recent memory, but, yeah. uh, yeah. Cause like I did genuinely care about these bits, like the amazing Spider-Man stuff. And, um, but it didn't really get me so much interested in any of the other things I should say, like, uh, in that same regard, and yeah, actually, well, that, that Kane stuff is that supposed to be going on in Amazing Spider-Man two or? So I, I I think so. That's the thing. Some of them I couldn't even tell where it was going to pop up. That stuff yeah. I was going to say was also interesting to me because I'm a big Scarlet Spider fan. I really like the look of his costume. I I used yeah. to like that character a lot. 
and that and same with with the Ben Riley stuff. That's all going back to the Clone War era, right? So like, um, yeah. so which you know, I know that's not a great <laughs> era for a lot of Spider-Man fans that lived through the '90s. They remember that, but you know, he's been tapping into a lot of these '90s concepts here. I mean, so and some of them have been successful. I feel like so we'll see. Um, yeah, this is just kind of gave you a little bit more of what you've already seen in that first issue of the spe spectacular Spider-Men. And yeah, this stuff. Yeah, I do like this Kane stuff here, the Scarlet Spider stuff. I'm yeah. interested to see where that goes. I hope that's in the main series. I hope that's not like its own thing. Um, yeah. But we'll see. I mean, because that's kind of interesting to me. Yeah, if it's in the main series, I read it, but I'm definitely not going out of my way to read this. No, stuff. no. I think it is because the Chasm stuff was drawn by Greg Land, and so was this. Yeah. So I'm guessing. I'm guessing that it's the same stuff that's going to be... Um, it just says Kane will return. So who the fuck knows yeah. where he's going to pop up, right? But anyways. Uh, oh, and then you got some Spider-Man 2099 stuff, which I don't hate either all so much. But I don't know what the hell is going on here. I know I'm not going to read it, but... Yeah, who cares what the... What yeah. Fred Stacey, the Green Goblin there, big deal. Like, so everything's so wacky in that 2099 universe, so it doesn't matter. Right. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is happening in Spider-Verse, right? So I'm not going to yeah. read it in there. There's the uh, the teams here. So, yeah, well, let's see here. Uh, Chasm. So, Chasm was written by Steve Fox. So, it's not Zeb Wells. Steve Fox is the guy that's been doing those, like, uh, Dead X-Men and and those series. The uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then so is the Kane story. So, that's either going to be its own thing or, yeah, maybe he's going to co-write some of these backup stories in Amazing Spider-Man or maybe, I don't know. So, we'll see what happens with that. What would you give this? I give it a 3.5. 3.75 because of the cover. Oh, no, I can't even give it that. This is like yeah, no, no 3.75. Yeah, take that back. 3.25. I'll give it a 3.5, yeah. Yeah, 3.25 for me. All right, that's going to do it for this week of what we read, guys. But we do have some comic solicitations here to get to. So let's take a look at this. Yeah. <laughs> Hold on. I just want to show you a comparison. This is the tall boy. This is the other can. Jesus. I got like freaking eight more of these to drink. Not today, but yeah, yeah, over yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, you you clearly just picked up the wrong ones that you normally pick up. But that's <laughs> you have a couple of those. I bet you're feeling pretty nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I know I mentioned at the top of the show we're gonna maybe look at some solicitations today, but we ran a little bit long, and uh, so we will probably look at those next week. So stay tuned for that. We'll look at the June solicitations. They'll all be out by then. And uh, we'll talk about what we're looking forward to from Marvel DC. And sometimes we even take a look at image, see what, what new is coming out from them as well. But Chris, what are you looking forward to checking out next week, man? So next week for what? March 27th. Yeah. I might take a look at the edge of spider verse. I don't think I'm buying it, but who knows? Sometimes I'll throw it in my box, but definitely rise of power of X. Got Wolverine 46. That's pretty much it from Marvel, and we'll see what DC's got. And how much from DC? There's a Harley Quinn 38. Well, I think I got a decent cover coming of that. Uh, some Women's History Month cover is looking pretty good. Oh, Probably nice. Power Girl. That's it. So it looks like it's going to be a small week, and uh, I don't know if there's anything out from Image. Well, Duke 4, I guess. Let's see there. So that's yeah. about it. Yeah, I got Batman Dark Age number one comes out next week. It looks like Harley Quinn 38. Black Hammer the end number six, which I think might be the actual end to the end. I think uh, either that, it's either six or seven issues. That might actually be the end. Amazing Spider Man 46. Oh, yeah, about two. Rise what? of Powers of X number three. Ultimate Spider Man number three. What? And that's what I have here, anyways. I don't know. Am I wrong on that? But. I don't know. I don't see it on my list, but uh, maybe I'm, this could be just not Roll, up there. Roll Tree 9. Zorro Man of the Dead number 3 comes out next week, too. And as oh, Chris nice. mentioned, Duke and Wolverine. So, yeah, some good stuff coming out next week. A good assortment of things here. But more importantly, Chris, what was your favorite book of the week this week? I don't know. It's, uh, it's There's a few good ones out this week. Some surprisingly good ones. If I had to kind of get my top few here, like Cobra Commander's in the running, Iron Man's in the running. I think I picked Iron Man last week, and I don't think it was as great as the last time. But I might have to go with, I'd go with X-Men Forever. 
I was just happy to freaking kind of get a hold of the story again and get back on track with everything that's going on. Wow. Wow. I'm surprised. I'm surprised. I did enjoy it, but yeah. Uh, for me, it's undeniably Wonder Woman this week. I had to give it to this. This is the, the most fun I think I had with a book this week. It was a pretty cool uh, one shot issue. I felt like uh, the only, the well, only thing I think that would have uh, possibly gave it a run for its money this week was Nightwing one twelve, which Chris also hated. So uh, no, <laughs> no, I just like I like giving him a hard time because for a while there, guys, he he said I don't like this Nightwing character, but I keep reading this book and it's been pretty good. So I like rubbing it in whenever the book is good, in my opinion, anyway. <laughs> we know we know how much Chris likes uh, Nightwing. <laughs> Anything you got to say on that, Chris, before we wrap? <laughs> uh, no comment. He's been uh, my favorite book before. I just don't like, don't like give it to him. <laughs> Come on, Nightwing, really? No, no, I didn't give it to Nightwing. I gave it to Wonder Woman, but yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, well, that's going to do it for this week. Thanks again, as always, for tuning in. And stay tuned for next week. Uh, we will be getting to those uh, comic solicitations. Sorry to cut that short here today. But uh, we'll see you guys all then. And uh, thanks again to Chris. And have a good week, everyone. All right. Cheers. Cheers.